Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Quest. I'm the chair of the Co Iowa State College Republicans. I want to begin by thanking everyone for coming to Iowa State this morning for our event, um, and I hope you enjoy our speaker. Uh, this morning, I have the honor of introducing former Speaker of the House and current presidential candidate, Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich is the architect of the contract with America that led the Republican Party to victory in 1994 by capturing the majority in the U.S. House for the first time. I'll just go without it. Oh, wow. uh, that led the Republican Party to victory in 1994 by capturing the majority in the U.S. House uh, for the first time in 40 years. Under Newt's leadership, Congress passed the first balanced budget in generations leading to the repayment of over $400 billion in debt. Congress also cut taxes for the first time in 16 years and reformed welfare, leading to over 60% of welfare recipients either getting a job or going to school. In addition, the Congress restored funding to strengthen our defense and intelligence capabilities, uh, an action later lauded by the bipartisan 9-11 Commission. The Washington Times has called Newt Gingrich the indispensable leader, and Time Magazine, the name of him Man of the Year for 1995, said, Leaders make things possible. Exceptional leaders make them inevitable. Newt Gingrich belongs in the category of the exceptional. Born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Newt's experience as the son of a career soldier convinced him at an early age to dedicate his life to his country and to the protection of freedom. Realizing the importance of understanding the past in order to protect the future, he immersed himself in the study of history, receiving his bachelor's degree from Emory University and master's and doctorate in modern European history from Tulane University. First elected in 1978, he represented Georgia in Congress for 20 years, including four years as Speaker of the House. Newt also served on the Defense Policy Board under George W. Bush, which provided strategic counsel to the Pentagon Security um, of, uh, of Defense on how to better address a threat facing the United States. Newt is widely recognized for his commitment to a better system of health for all Americans. His leadership helped save Medicare from bankruptcy. Prompted FDA reform to help the seriously ill and initiated a new focus on research, preservation, and wellness. In 2003, Newt founded the Center for Health Transformation to develop free market healthcare reforms to foster a 21st century system of health and healthcare that is centered on the individual, prevention focused, knowledge intense, and innovation rich. Uh, with that, it is my honor to introduce former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm actually standing behind this so the TV cameras pick up Iowa State. Um, the, uh, this is a rare opportunity for me because this is such a good science and technology and engineering university that it gives me a chance to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is a long way outside of normal politics. But before I do that, let me just say very briefly that we did yesterday in Des Moines uh, uh, announce a 21st century contract with America. This is the legislative component. There are actually four components to it. One component uh, is executive orders. Uh, it's a, you can go to newt.org and you'll see a section on, on the very first day. And the idea is that after the inaugural address, I would sign somewhere between 50 and 200 executive orders moving the federal government as of the very first day uh, within the framework of the law. For example, the very first executive order would abolish all of the White House czars. Uh, and so you'd go through a series of those steps. The second part of the contract is the uh, legislative program, which we would try to get enacted in the first year. Uh, that's longer than we took with the contract with America in 94, because these are more complicated, they're much bigger, uh, many of them are newer, uh, and because I think people are sick of things being rushed through Congress, like the stimulus package that nobody had even read, uh, like Obamacare, which Speaker Pelosi said you have to pass the bill to learn what's in it. Uh, I think the fact is that we, we, people want to see regular order where subcommittees hold hearings, they have open markups, they go to full committee, they hold hearings, they have open markups, they go to the floor, they have the right to amend on the floor. 
Uh, I'm going to recommend to the Congress that the conference committees be on C-SPAN so that because they're, they're among the most important meetings. And so people ought to see legislation being written because this represents such a large scale of change that you need to be involved. So the first thing is, is the legislative program. The second thing is executive orders on the first day. The third part of the new contract is a training program for all the transition team and all the presidential personnel on the grounds that the scale of change we're going to try to implement is so large that people really need to be trained into where we're going and what we're doing. For example, I think we should abolish the Department of Energy because it's been essentially an anti-American energy bureaucracy that has been remarkably incompetent. Well, if you, go out, if you go out to recruit a Secretary of Energy and you say, and your job is to get rid of your job, uh, you need to work through with them because the first thing that will happen is the bureaucracy and the interest groups will try to capture them to get them to say, oh, we really need to keep it. And so you need a training program that, 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 because we're going to be so different. The last part is you. The fourth part of this new contract is to tell people, I'm not asking you to be for me. Because if you're for me, you'll vote and you'll go home and you'll say, I sure hope he gets it done. That is impossible. Under our constitutional system, no single individual can achieve the scale of change we need. And so we need citizens who are willing to be with me for eight years, getting the Congress to do the right thing, getting your state legislators to do the right thing. Um, and at the risk of embarrassing her, the majority leader, Linda Upmeyer, is here so she can talk to you about the legislature later on. Um, getting the governor to do the right thing, but also if we shrink the Washington bureaucracy, if we implement the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, which says the powers are reserved to the state and the people, and Washington becomes smaller, citizens have to get bigger. So this is a real fundamental change I'm outlining for all of you. Now, I think where we are, and I'm going to explain it in more detail in a second, but I think where we are is captured brilliantly by Abraham Lincoln. This is the only thing I'm going to read to you today, but I think it is so profound you know, President Lincoln was an attorney who had never managed anything larger than a law firm with one partner. Uh, his entire military experience had been serving as a volunteer temporarily uh, in the Black Hawk War. And Lincoln came, found himself fighting a civil war, having to reorganize the federal government, having to organize the Army and the Navy. Just an, no, no president learns as much as Lincoln learned. He's a remarkable man. And it isn't going well. The war is very painful, the casualties are enormous, the cost is immense. And so in December of 1862, Lincoln writes a message to Congress. And this is part of what he wrote. And I think it fits us so perfectly that I want to share it with you. He says, quote, The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. I think we're in a very similar place, and I don't think our political system or our news media system has been capable of having the conversation we need. We're in a different place for three very big reasons. The first is we're now in a world market, which is real and permanent. We're going to be competing from here on out. We came out of World War II, the dominant country in the world. Uh, all of our competitors had been bombed either by us or by the Nazis or the Japanese. Uh, the result was that we were over 50% of the world's economy in 1945. And we sustained an enormous momentum for a long time. Now we have real competitors. China is a real competitor. It's not a bad thing. They have every right to pursue happiness. But it does mean we've got to sort of roll up our sleeves and decide to compete. India is going to be a real competitor. And so we're in a different world in that sense. Second, we're going to have an enormous explosion of science and technology. Uh, I believe in the next 25 years, we're going to have four to seven times as much new science as we had in the last 25 years. We're more scientists alive today than all of previous human history. They are connected with better computers and better lab equipment every year. They communicate with each other through cell phone and through social media with enormous speed. And they're connected to the marketplace by licensing, royalties, venture capital. So we're in a world of enormous change. We also are changing as a people. We're living longer. 
Remember, Social Security was developed for retirement at 65 when the average person died at 62. It was a sign of FDR's genius as a politician that people were grateful for a program most of them wouldn't get. The average age people lived in 1900 was 46. A young girl born in Japan last year will live on, on average to be 89. That means half of them will live longer than 89. Nobody's ever tried to design a world like that. And not only are we living longer, we're living differently. If you go and look at student dorms today, and you go back and look at student dorms 30 years ago or 40 years ago. You know, part of the increasing cost of college, candidly, is people live better. You know, you, you look at high schools that have to have huge parking lots. Why do they have to have huge parking lots? Because every junior and senior is driving. Go back 40 or 50 years ago, it would have been unthinkable to have that scale of mobility. So people, think of yourselves. I mean, how many of you want, you know, instant on television with 600 channels and then find out on Wednesday evening there's nothing you want to watch. <laughs> you know, you want instant food, you want microwave ovens. I mean, this is a very different world than the world of our parents and grandparents. And we haven't adjusted to it yet. And the greatest lagging indicator is government. Because bureaucracies are built not to change. I used to, I used to do a, a riff about uh, Fedra, FedEx and, and uh, UPS, which was actually a YouTube video called FedEx versus a federal bureaucracy, and uh, several million people watched it. And, and it was a very simple model. Um, how many of you have ever tracked a package on either UPS or FedEx? Just raise your hand. Okay, so, so this is not a theory, right? You know, we have technology today which enables us to track people, to track, to track packages in virtually real time at no extra cost. It's just part of the program. The federal government has somewhere between 11 and 20 million illegal immigrants we can't find. And I've suggested that we simply send each of them a package. <laughs> now, in a way, what I'm suggesting is silly, but it's also illustrating a fundamental principle, isn't it? Uh, I was just down at the, at the Florida virtual school system. Uh, Jeb Bush created a virtual school in Florida. It now has 80,000 students, K through 12. It's a different world. Things are evolving every day, and yet government is so encumbered. One of the reasons I'm very intrigued with Strong America Now is that it seeks to apply Lean Six Sigma to modernize the federal government. It would be the largest change in government since the Civil Service Acts of the 1880s. It would change 130 years of the way we behave. And we have to do it. We have to have a government which improves on a continuing basis. So there's another, re there, there's another reason I want to come here today. I, I really want to recruit scientists, engineers, technologists, and students of science and engineering because of something which C.P. Snow spoke about in 1959. C.P. Snow was a physicist, a novelist, and a political figure. He was a cabinet officer in Great Britain. In 1959, he did the Wreath Lecture on the BBC, and he invented what he called the two cultures. He said, in the 19th century, an educated person knew science and they knew Shakespeare. In the 20th century, we split them apart. And the more you specialized in science and math and, and engineering, the less you knew about literature. And the more you specialized in the social sciences and in history, the less you knew about science. He said the result is today, if you really know a lot scientifically, you probably are inarticulate. And if you're really articulate, you probably don't know a lot about science. So the result is if you see somebody on TV and you can't understand them, they may be right, but you don't know what they said. And if you see somebody on TV and they're really clear, they're almost certainly wrong, uh, but they sound good. <laughs> That's a huge part of where we are. One of the, the only one of these I'm going to talk about today is number seven. I mean, I mean number eight, which is uh, really different, I think, than, than any politician you've ever dealt with. I spent three years with Bob Carey, the former senator, from, Democratic senator from Nebraska, co-chairing an Alzheimer's study group. 
And, what fa and, I, and I've studied science off and on my whole lifetime. Bef before I decided at 15 to, to do what I'm doing now, I wanted to be either a vertebrate paleontologist or a zoo director. So I've, I've had a real interest in the natural world for my whole life. And as we studied Alzheimer's, which was a huge challenge for this country, uh, the estimate is that Alzheimer's from now to 2050 will cost $20 trillion. And it's a human problem. It lasts a very long time. And the caregivers are twice as likely to have health problems as people who aren't dealing with Alzheimer's because of the stress and the strain and the difficulty. So it's a really big challenge. $20 trillion, by the way, is one and a half federal debts. So if you want to see the scale, if you're, if you're representing the scale of Alzheimer's on a graph, you'd have U.S. federal debt, 14 trillion, Alzheimer's, 20. So it's a huge challenge. So as we were digging into this, here's what, remember my basic model, we're going to have four to seven times as much new science. Now here's what makes this fascinating as a public policy challenge. Four to seven times as much new science. If it's four times as much new science as we got in the last 25 years, it means that you right now are the equivalent of being in 1900. The Wright brothers have not yet flown. Ford has not yet developed the mass-produced car. There is no commercial radio. Television doesn't exist. But think about it. How would you sit in 1900 and design today? There have been so many breakthroughs. Now, we're talking about 25 years. I mean, there are people in this room who will still barely be middle-aged in the period I'm describing. But if there's seven times as much new science, you're with Sir Isaac Newton trying to discover calculus around 1660. That's how big the scale of change I'm describing. So now you apply it to brain science and you learn something really fascinating. We haven't known very much about the human brain because all the new instrumentation that lets us follow a human brain is only about 20 years old. So prior to, to sometime around 1990, we couldn't figure out what was going on in your head because we had no mechanism for following it. As we've started to study your brain, we've learned that you have about as many neurons as there are stars in the known universe. So one person, you are, one person is potentially the same volume of data as all of astrophysics. These are the two largest users of computing power that we have. And the brain scientists I meet with tell me, you actually have to have, you actually have to go through two cycles of computer improvement to get enough speed and enough, and enough storage capacity to deal with what we're going to learn in the next 20 years. That the current generation of computing will not be capable of dealing with the volume of data we're going to get. Now why does this matter to you? What if you could accelerate brain science? Alzheimer's, autism, Parkinson's, mental health, learning faster. I mean, how many things does your brain relate to? And so I'm proposing three steps here to dramatically accelerate brain science. This has a big impact on the federal budget, a big impact on every American, and it has, I think, a very big impact on job creation because health will be the biggest sector of the world economy. And as people get wealthier around the world, they're going to want to buy better health products. And if we are the leading producer of better health products, they're going to really be interested in what we're doing and they're going to buy from us. And that creates very high value added jobs and brings tremendous amounts of foreign capital in the United States. So the three things are, first, I'm for zero capital gains tax. So we bring hundreds of billions of dollars into the US because what you want to do is make it very easy for a scientist with a new idea to find capital to start a company. Imagine you had the mental equivalent of 70 Apples or 70 Microsofts. Where somebody has a big idea, they go out, they start a company, and 10 years later they're employing 20,000 people selling worldwide. You want to accelerate the rise of small biologically based companies. Second, you want to fundamentally change the Food and Drug Administration to a new model. The current Food and Drug Administration stops new medicines. Their vision of protecting you is to not let things through. The model for all this is the iron lung. I'm actually trying to find an iron lung because I'd, I'd like to use it to demonstrate to people. In 1950, 60,000 people got polio. If you had projected from 1960 
1950. And you said, so in 2011, how many people will be in iron lungs paid for by the federal government and what will the budget be? The correct current answer is zero. And the reason is Jonas Salk discovered a vaccine. Now here was the sequence. The first year he discovered the vaccine, he gave it to his own family to prove it was safe. The second year, a million four hundred thousand volunteers were vaccinated to see if it was safe. They were that desperate to get a vaccine against polio. The third year, the whole country was vaccinated. That process in the current FDA would take 25 years and cost a couple hundred, maybe might cost as much as a billion dollars. That's how much we've slowed down the, the introduction of new knowledge. There's a parallel to that with, with EPA, but I'm not going to get into it today. Okay, but, but for anybody who's going into science and technology and engineering, there's a big parallel with EPA. Anyway, the third thing I want to do is I want to build a brand new brain science project modeled on the Human Genome Project, the Apollo Project to go to the moon, and the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb. And I want to say to the brain science community, we don't want politicians deciding how much they can allocate out of current resources because that gets all involved in, in who else wants the money. We, we've got just in Alzheimer's, forget Parkinson's, autism, mental health, et cetera, just in autism, I mean, just in Alzheimer's, we got $20 trillion sitting on the table. Brain scientists tell us if you slow down, don't, you don't have to cure it, if you slow down the rate of onset, because it's largely a disease of aging, if you slow it down by five years, you save between eight and, t and ten trillion dollars. They have this entire super committee looking for a trillion five. If I walked into them and said, I can get you five times that amount of money, they wouldn't listen to me for one minute. Because it, it's, it's Lincoln's point. This is new thinking. This is a new approach. It's different. So the question you ought to ask yourself, and you could go to the business school and ask them to work this out as, a, as an investment question. If you have eight to ten trillion dollars in savings on the table, what size investment is worthwhile to save eight to ten trillion? Now, all of you understand this model because all of you change oil in your car. So the engine doesn't freeze up. I have a friend who once didn't do that, and he had this red light. It was his first car, and he came out of a family that didn't educate him very much. And he couldn't figure out why this red light kept going on. And one morning, his engine froze. Uh, and he actually had to get a new engine. And ever since, he became a fanatic about changing oil. So all of us understand the idea of investing to avoid cost. So what's it worth to save eight to 10 trillion? It's worth a heck of a lot more than we're spending right now. And the way I would pay for it in a time of, of really difficult budgets is, I would issue Alzheimer's bonds that you could buy. they would be US savings bonds, specifically designated for brain research. And the agreement would be, if we get the five year postponement and we save the money, the first slice of money goes to pay off the bonds. So you now have an investment strategy to pay for the research to then, re reward, to then pay it off. And you save human suffering, you save families from health problems, and you save trillion, literally trillion, not billions, trillions of dollars. And the second order effect is gonna be all the other things you learn. So Alzheimer's alone will pay for all the research into all the different aspects of the brain. That's, that's how big it is. Now, this is fundamentally different. And I, I can assure you, this will become, this, num this number eight will become very controversial. But it's a conversation we have to have. If we're truly, I mean, it's very simple. Are we in a period of massive scientific change? Do we want to be the most rapidly evolving country in the world with the highest level of productivity, producing the best products, and, and having the highest paid jobs? How do you rethink the federal government so it accelerates rather than messes up getting into a better future? Will breakthroughs save money? Is it a fact that the Salk vaccine has in fact saved an immense amount of pain and immense amount of money? because you don't deal with polio anymore. I mean, these things are either factually real and now let's have a conversation about them, or they're a fantasy. I guarantee you in Washington, D.C., this will be seen as Newt's fantasy because it's too new, it's too big. But it fits exactly what your life will be. Whether it's going into space, which we've managed to mess up so totally, that we went from being a country that got to the moon in seven years to a country that doesn't have a space shuttle. I mean, do you realize how bad the bureaucracy has to be to go through this cycle. And it isn't because we didn't spend money. We spent tons of money. We just spent it badly on bureaucracy. So whether it's engineering or it's construction or the, the, the opportunities are enormous 
for us to create a better future. And places like Iowa State are exactly where we should have this conversation because we need people who know science and technology and engineering being involved in the political process so people understand what the possibilities are. Because a lot of the future will be invented in places like Iowa State. So that's a sweeping overview. I'd, I'd love for you to go to newt.org and read the contract. It's a, it's a pretty sophisticated document. I think it's the right size in general. Uh, and I'd like you to be with me, but I won't ask you to be for me. And I'd love to just toss it wide open for questions. Do, do we have microphones or how do we, are we just going to talk? We're just going to talk apparently. Go ahead. Why don't, why don't you stand up though so that way people can at least hear you. As one of your executive orders you had signed on the first day, what would you do about executive order 10988, which would be Kennedy's allowing the uh, public sector to union, I mean, the public sector to unionize? We've had problems with this in Wisconsin. I mean, uh, I'd want to, I'd, if, if that's the, if that is the, uh, way it's worded, I'm, I, I, I'd have to look at it, but I'm, I would be very tempted to look at, and I will go, now that you've raised it, nobody's raised this before, uh, I will go and look at what Mitch Daniel did in Indiana, because there they had unionized by executive order, and he took very immediate steps as soon as he went in, and so I would look very, very. I'll, I'll, I'll email Mitch today and get his information on what he did, and I'll, since he's the former director of the budget, I'll ask him to look at uh, the Kennedy executive order and see to what extent it could be uh, modified just by an executive order. It's a very good, ex that's why we have a, a page at newt.org on the first day which people can go to, uh, which is designed to do that. Okay? Thank you. Good. Yes, sir. Cool. Now, the, the, the first one I want to think about some because it's a condition of employment that's negotiable. Um, that is, you're getting paid a larger salary for giving up your patent rights than you would have gotten paid if you didn't give up your patent rights. So the, uh, it's interesting to look at, and I'll talk to some people about it. The second one, I agree with you. Uh, look, look, this is obviously because this is a very smart science and technology school. So you're probably not representative of the country at large. But I'm curious, for those of you who are students here, how many of you found stretches of high school boring? Okay, let, let, me give you a, let me give you a thought experiment, okay? This is actually something which Mitch Daniel has, has gotten into law in Indiana that I first talked to him about about five years ago. How many of you, if, if we'd had a system that said, if you get through in three years, you get the cost of your fourth year as an automatic scholarship, how many of you could have gotten through high school in three years? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, how many could have gotten through in two years? Okay. Could any of you gotten through in one year? I'm curious. He could have. <laughs> I, I, I asked this one time, and the person in the back of the room yelled, how big is the reward again? <laughs> <laughs> now, here's what I want you to think about. And, and this, is, this is how much I'm prepared to challenge the orthodoxy. This is why I was fascinated with the, the Florida Virtual School, which I'd recommend for Iowa. I think the whole concept of a state or federal curriculum is profoundly wrong. It's, it's, a, it's a reform that started in the 20s and 30s. It was an effort to professionalize education, and it's exactly backwards. And here's why. You show up at school. There's a crisis in Greece. You're curious about the crisis in Greece. You actually would learn. You'd pay attention. You'd listen. But today is the day we're assigned the French Revolution. So the teacher says, don't ask me anything that's interesting because you've got to learn this. The teachers have been bureaucratized. I, I love teaching. 
Uh, I've, I've taught in high school, I've taught in college. Uh, teaching's a missionary vocation. You have to love teaching and you have, to, you have to really want people to learn to be a good teacher. There's something that happens that has passion. And if it doesn't have, so if you bureaucratize the process, you ultimately bureaucratize the teacher, you make it all boring and it all becomes a matter of cheating. Because you're studying, you're studying for the test. You're not studying to learn. You're studying to get through some test. And everybody knows it. And so you gradually take the life out of the system. I, I, there's, there's a, two examples. I, I, I talked to a woman the other day about gifted students. Uh, I think this was in uh, Council Bluffs. She has two four, fourth grade sons. They just took the ACT. Uh, and they scored at the middle range for a high school senior. Now, if she leaves them in a normal school, they're going to disintegrate because they're already capable of doing senior work in the fourth grade. I mean, they happen to be very smart. She's invested a lot of her life in them. You know, they really they read constantly, they learn constantly, they do math really well. They ought to be on a track that is their own unique. Learn as fast as you can. There's a there's a uh, the Indian health system, I mean, the Indian mathematics system, which is in English, um, is online. And there's a student, there's, a, there's an 11 year old in upstate New York who's doing college level calculus. Uh, just because he found it and he was interested, so he goes to it, you know, when, when he's done doing school, he goes and really learns. So he endures the school, which he's now way past, in order to have time to go. But he's socialized, he's supposed to go to school because he's only 11 and therefore. You know, it would be bad if he wasn't sitting there being bored. So I want you to think about this. We need to really think about fundamentally recentering. Now, for special ed students, we now have this model of a personal contract. You know, every special ed student in theory is supposed to have their own personal curriculum. Well, why don't we do that for every single student? And then why don't we say, you know, you're going to learn your whole life. So a lot of the breakpoints we invented in the 19th century don't really work anymore. If you can do... Uh, High, college senior level history in the ninth grade, you ought to do it. And if you can do, you know, graduate level math in the seventh grade, you ought to do it. And we ought to figure out, so how do you get credit for that and how do, how do you get credentialed for life so somebody can hire you? But if we go back to accelerating people and teaching people and encouraging people, the American people will, will they will respond amazingly fast. And the other point you made is exactly right. If the teacher is the authority figure, you can't question them. If the knowledge is the authority figure, then you and the teacher are both engaged in a quest. Fundamentally different model. Bureaucracies have to center power in authority figures. Professions center power in knowledge. Fundamentally different models. And we chose the wrong model. And it's going to have to be changed. Yes, sir. Right. Education system. I appreciated everything you said. Well, thank you very much. I wasn't quite sure actually where you were going with all the different things you're doing. I, I, was, I was standing there thinking either this is going to be really good or really bad. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. But, but let me, I mean, this is part of why my campaign is so different. My campaign is really a cultural campaign with a political component. I'm really talking about re, rebuilding and reinventing the entrepreneurial America. That, you know, the Wright brothers did not ask permission to invent flying. And if they had asked permission, and this is, but this is why, if you've invented your whole, invested your whole life in the school of education, the number of years of tenure, the extra certification, et cetera, you've now tried to surround yourself with paper. And all, we all of a sudden strip away the paper and require you to surround yourself with knowledge and learning and energy. It's terrifying. It is frightening. I mean, people have a legitimate right to be frightened. They invested their whole life in a bureaucratic structure which is failing. 
But, they, but, but it's the only structure they're comfortable in. So the, the transition costs of this kind of change are enormous. But think about the Wright brothers. One of, one of my favorite stories for all of you would-be entrepreneurs. The Wright brothers were my bicycle mechanics. Now, I mean, it's a slight understatement because in, in their generation, that was a high-end technology. They studied birds. They were pretty sophisticated. They, they built their own wind tunnel. They had help from the U.S. government. They went to the National Weather Service and said, where's the best continuous uplift in the United States? And it's a kitty hawk coming off the ocean going up the hill. So the National Weather Service played a role. The Smithsonian had a $50,000 grant from the Congress to invent flying and had really good scientists. And this is one of the great studies of the difference between what works and what fails in America. The Wright brothers every summer went down to Kitty Hawk by train from Dayton, Ohio. They took a lot of extra wood because they knew something really important. They didn't know how to fly. And since they didn't know how to fly, they were going to crash. And they took the extra wood so that when they crashed, they could rebuild the plane. They also, because they didn't know how to fly, decided to build a very light airplane, which required a very light engine. So it's very underpowered. The, the original Wright Flyer is, very, is underpowered because, because they understood something else, which is if you build a heavier engine, you have to build a heavier plane. And since they thought they would crash a lot, they wanted a light plane that they could rebuild easily. And so they would get up in the morning, fix coffee, go up on the top of the hill, start down the hill, and crash. Pick the plane up, go back up, fix it. Go back. They do this six or seven times a day. They do this, I think, for three years. Finally fly in December of 1903. The first time they fly, it is slow enough that one brother is running along next to the plane so it doesn't flip over. The distance they fly is shorter than the wingspan of a Boeing 747. And they never get high enough to get over the fuselage. But they flew. Once they understood what worked, they improved it so rapidly that in 1907, they flew around the island of Manhattan and a million and a half people saw an airplane for the first time. So that there was, they were really, once they got it, they could improve it, but they had to get it first. Meanwhile, the Smithsonian, which has all this money and all this scientists and all this prestige, they don't want to go as far away as Kitty Hawk because it's inconvenient. So they got to figure out how do you get wind under the wings. They invent something which we still use today. They put a catapult on a ship just like aircraft carriers. However, that means you are launching the plane over the Potomac. Now, remember, the Wright brothers understood the most important thing. They didn't know how to fly. The Smithsonian, because they can afford it, get the best German metallurgy, and they build a really, really powerful engine, which means it's really heavy, which means you have to have a really heavy frame. So now you got this big, sophisticated, heavy airplane being launched over water by a sophisticated catapult. And the Smithsonian had missed the first key point. They thought they knew how to fly. So the plane, and the Smithsonian was so confident, they bring reporters down to watch. So early one morning in Alexandria, Virginia, the fog lifts off the river. Here's the boat and the airplane. They launch it, and it goes straight into the river, because it doesn't fly. And because it's heavy, it sinks. Now that means, A, you gotta get it up out of the river. B, you have no idea what originally broke, because everything's been broken up by the water. C, you can't afford to rebuild it, it's too expensive. The Smithsonian was so resentful of the Wright brothers, that they treated them so badly, that for 35 years, the Wright brothers would not give them their airplane. It's now in the Air and Space Museum. But for 35 years, they wouldn't give it to them. They were so mad. Because the Wright brothers are going around the world as perfect American entrepreneurs. Don't have advanced degrees. Didn't get permission from the government. Weren't subsidized by Congress. They only had one virtue. They actually flew. Now, I think there's a profound symbolic message about how we need to fundamentally rethink what we've been doing and get away from planning, process, you know, 60 copies to be reviewed by three people you've never met who've never done it either in order to get a small grant, waiting six months of your life to see whether or not you get the grant. And we got to go back to a country where we just go do things. Yes?
one back there, over there. Hey, prof we have a couple of professors here. You, you, were in, you were in San Diego? Um, I wasn't in San Diego, but that's, yes, great. Um, so the question is, are you, are you being able to communicate with these scientists that are so critical when, when your plan, when they're of a different political persuasion? How are you going to cross that line? I, I am curious, if, if you don't mind me putting it in the spot, what was the reception among neuroscientists? Yeah, my, my experience in meetings, and we've had meetings with Nobel Prize winners, we've had meetings with 10 and 20 neuroscientists at a time. Uh, my experience is that, that when you get them into the topic, I'm not arguing about ideology, they're fascinated. And they like the idea you care about it. Uh, you know, but look, I think, I think I would say this right. I think the job of a leader is to communicate a vision sufficiently compelling that people suspend disbelief and are willing to try. When, when we passed welfare reform, we got half the Democrats to vote yes. It was 101 to 101. And, and you know, one of the things I'm trying to get the House Republicans to do right now is to take a bill by Senator Webb and Senator Warner, who are two Democrats. It's a bill that allows Virginia to develop oil and gas offshore. It gives 50% of the royalties to the federal government, 37 and a half to Virginia, 12 and a half to land conservation and infrastructure. And I want the House Republicans to pass it with no amendment. Send it to the Senate so that Senator Reid gets a Democratic bill authored by two Democratic senators, supported by Tim Kaine, the former governor who was the Democratic national chairman. And I don't think he can bottle it up. And at that point, it'll go to the president. And I don't see how the president vetoes a bill which creates more American energy to create more American jobs to increase revenue to the federal government. I mean, how, how does he, in this economy, veto that bill authored by two Democrats? But that, you know, but bipartisanship has to be intelligent. And it doesn't, the, the, the Washington model is, what are you going to sell out to be bipartisan? That's what, that's what they mean. Okay, my model is, what can I find that we agree on that enables us to be bipartisan. So I'm not going to go into a room of neuroscientists and decide on an argument about philosophical conservatism. But I may go into a room with neuroscientists and say, is it possible to design a dramatically better approach to science? And by the way, what I would do will be very controversial with scientists for a different reason. There are a lot of scientists who are invested in the NIH small grant peer review system. And you start suggesting that the human genome model is a better model, you're going to have all sorts of folks whose rice bowls are getting overturned, and they're going to be talking, I mean, they're as bad about pork barrel as anybody else. So it's not like the scientists are pure at heart and everything is perfect. They have their own culture, their own systems, their own inside groups. But that's not my job. I mean, you know, my job is to represent the nation. And that is, that's as true whether I'm talking to the oil industry or whether I'm talking to scientists or whether I'm talking to somebody else. And it's not, my job isn't to try to figure out how to go out here and take care of everybody. If you're not prepared to rethink what you're doing, you don't understand the world we're in because if you don't rethink it, the world's going to rethink it for you. So it's not like this is an optional class. This is going to happen. The only question is whether we're smart enough to get ahead of it or we wait till it runs us over. Yes, sir. No, I'll come to you. Okay. In Iraq, nobody understands where the 3,000 withdrawal figure came from and why they would do that. In Afghanistan, nobody understands why we would, why we would withdraw troops in the middle of a fighting season next year. And the lifting of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, privately, soldiers will tell you how upset they are that it's being lifted because of the corrosive effect it's going to have on unit cohesion. Right. Can that genie be, be put back in the bottle? Um. Yeah, you, you, can, you can certainly reverse the president's position on social engineering in the military. I mean, I, I was underwhelmed when Leon Panetta proudly announced that 97% of the troops have now gone through sensitivity training. 
Uh, somehow that wasn't why I thought we recruited people to be on active duty. In the middle of the fight, I had to stop what I was doing and spend three hours on John F. Hotel instead of fighting the Taliban and then get a memo to make sure it was in the right hands. Just make sure it happened. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, you, have, you have to start with the idea that this is an administration of extraordinarily anti-military prejudice, which just hides it. Okay? I mean, this president is not a commander-in-chief in any normal sense. He's a politician-in-chief. Uh, the three th my dad spent 27 years in the infantry. I grew up as an army brat. I am totally opposed to 3,000 troops being left in Iraq. This is a target. They can't defend themselves. They, are, they, have, they have Iran next door. The Iranians have every vested interest in killing us. No, no currently serving general recommended 3,000. 3,000 is a political number. I think it is despicable for the President of the United States to choose a political number against the advice of his generals for some political reason so his press office feels good at the risk of their lives. And I take this very personally as an Army brat. I think this is a disastrous decision. You either stay in with adequate troops to protect themselves, which is in the 20 to 24,000 range, or you get out. And frankly, given this president, we're probably safer to get out because I don't think he'll do the things necessary to be protected. Iraq has been decaying steadily. The Iranians are on offense in Iraq. We are on defense. And I think nobody understands yet how this, well, I'm, I'm going to give three or four speeches on national security in the near future. I'm going to propose to the other candidates that we have three additional debates only on national security and only allow generals to be the questioners, no news media. So we have a serious national security debate. Um, we are in much deeper trouble than people think we are. In Afghanistan, and correct me if you think I'm, I'm way off on this, the length of time it would take for us to create a modern Afghanistan is beyond any plausible American investment. And the impossibility of doing that, as long as the Pakistanis create a sanctuary for the Taliban, is 100%. I mean, as long as they can run, hide, rearm, and refit in Pakistan, uh, we're never going to win the war. Right. You know, if we can prevent another Al Qaeda there, I mean, that's our victory there. But frankly, we're, we're going we're gonna to take out Al Qaeda as the way they just did it in Yemen, where I do give the president credit. I, I want to say this because the, the press asked me this morning, and it's important to make this clear. Any American who actively advocates killing Americans places themselves in our Constitution as a traitor. The American who the president authorized killing in Yemen was an enemy combatant. Enemy combatants don't get Miranda rights. And it's very important that this is a war. This is not a criminal adventure. Let's say the attorney general is totally wrong in how he approaches it. The president in this one area is right. But remember, Al-Qaeda now, if we totally seal off Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda is in Yemen, it's in Somalia, I mean, it, it is spreading across the planet. And, and it's not just, I mean, we, we have these words, so they can say Al-Qaeda is weaker, but by the way, there are these seven new groups. Well, the seven new groups are all branches of Al-Qaeda. I mean, the fact is, there is an anti-Western movement growing and growing in multiple countries, including here. We've, we've arrested now, I think, over 130 people inside the United States plotting various things, including some of the other day who was plotting a, an event at the New York ports. I'm allowed to have one last question, but thank you for serving our country. It's very, very important. Yes, sir. Uh, you emphasize the importance of science and technology, and, and really the changing scene with China coming online and investing in the future now. Uh, so in that context, I wonder, how do you rate the success of uh, NSF and, uh, for that matter, uh, DOE uh, Office of Science in, in funding and so well, I think the National Science Foundation overall has been relatively successful, but it's too small. Uh, when we, the biggest mistake when I was speaker, when we doubled the size of NIH, uh, we should, the National Institute of Health, we should have tripled the size of the National Science Foundation because it's much smaller. And much of the 
science that sustains the National Institutes of Health, particularly in physics, chemistry, and mathematics, actually come out of the National Science Foundation. So that, that was a mistake. Overall, it's not a bad system. It's not perfect. We have too many small grants. And the problem with the peer review system is it, it makes it, you know, Einstein would never have been accepted in a peer review system. So if we don't have enough outliers that get money. And, and, we, and we tend to focus too many young scientists on filling out grant forms and sitting and waiting for the, for the grant. So I think we got to think about being more robust in how we approach it. Um, but I, I, I am the Advanced Research Project Agency, which is now called DARPA, the defense of it, is actually the most successful. And interestingly, it requires a complete turnover every three years of the people who are there. So that there's a constant process of new ideas, new energy, new approaches uh, that has been very, very successful. And it's probably the most successful government. It's the place that invented most of the modern computer. And it's the place that, that paid to invent. They paid. They don't do it. But they also, it, it paid for the internet. I mean, all that stuff. I mean, Al Gore wasn't working at DARPA at the time. But the DARPA itself actually did it. Uh, I'm going to let you have the last question. Because you were patient. You're sitting up here. Yes. Sure. Illegal immigrants get in state tuition, and that sometimes raises the prices for citizens. Okay, good question. Now, the question was how would you control the border? He's from California, so he has a lively interest in this. Um, let me start out as a historian. Any country which seriously wants to control the border controls the border. You apply manpower, you apply technology, and you control it. Okay. Ronald Reagan wrote in 1986 in his diary, he was signing the Simpson-Mazzoli Act because we had to get control of the border. That's 25 years ago. We defeated Japan, Germany, and Italy in 44 months. Between December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor, and the surrender of Japan is literally three years and eight months. So what, what I'm proposing here is two things. First, a bill which we would introduce and, and move at the very beginning, which we're having drafted now, which, says, which would say all federal regulations and laws are waived for the purpose of completing the border control by January 1, 19, uh, 2014, so that it is literally dealt with the way we would in wartime. So no environmental impact studies, you know, no, none, of, none of the various things that make it harder. You just say control it, period. Second, there are 23,000 people employed by the Department of Homeland Security in the Washington area. I would be prepared to move half of them to Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona to ensure adequate manpower. But this idea that, that you, have, you, have, you have the Rio Grande, the entire Texas-Mexico border is a river. The idea that you can't design, for example, infrared technology that says water person. <laughs> you know, this, I mean, these things are not, come, if this was a military operation, if you go look what the Israelis do uh, in much harder circumstances, uh, they are remarkably effective at minimizing penetration. Now, I think, frankly, if, if we do that, the other thing you should do is have a cleaner, simpler, easier to use legal visa system. I mean, if somebody wants to visit the U.S. to go to Disney World, if somebody wants to come here as a student, if somebody wants to come up to buy some technology or to be engaged in business, it should be easy to come in legally. Today, it's more expensive and takes more time to be legal than it does to hire a coyote to come across the border. So you got to do the two in parallel. You want to make it easy to visit America legally within our law, and you want to make it virtually impossible to, visit, to come in illegally, and, and you can do it. I mean, historically, there's no doubt you can do this if you're serious. Let me um, thank all of you. I will I'll say two things. I think Iowa is vital to our campaign. I don't have the kind of money that Perry and Romney have. I'm not going to be able to go out and compete in a state the size of California right now. But if I come in first or second in Iowa, and can go on to New Hampshire and come in first or second and then get to South Carolina, I think I will be the nominee. And I think at that stage you have so much earned media that, that the value of the money that they raise is dramatically less relevant. Uh, McCain was outspent in Florida 10 to 1 and won the Florida primary because of earned media. So you can play a big role. I am asking you to be with me, not just through the primary or the caucus, not just through the election but for the next, for the eight years of actually implementing this. It's a huge assignment. If you get a chance, go to newt.org. You'll see how big it is. Uh, and we're open for you to help us improve it. We got a year to get this even better. And we appreciate your help. Thank you all very, very much.